Welcome back to EasySpin Academy 2020. Uh, this is the last topical session of uh, day two. In this session, we'll briefly look at um, EasySpin's capabilities to simulate pulse EPR spectra. The main function that does uh, pulse EPR spectral simulations is called Saffron. And let's start by looking at a very simple example. We set up a spin system um, with a G value of two Let's add one proton on top of the electron uh, with a hyperfine coupling tensor that's axial and uh, small. So let's say three and six megahertz. Again, the first number indicates the X and the Y value, and the second number indicates the Z value of the hyperfine coupling tensor. Um, let's set the fields now at 350 millitesla. Remember that um, pulse EPR spectra are performed at fixed field. So we don't specify field range to sweep, but we just specify fixed field. And um, then we have to specify the pulse, uh, uh, pulse sequence as well. For the fixed field, we just use exp.field. Now for the pulse sequence, we just say exp.sequence. And uh, one of the simplest ones is the two pulse echo uh, where we increment the tau values and that leads to an echo decay. And if you have nuclei that hyperfine coupled, it also leads to a modulation of the echo decay. And we'll build this up now. This is a predefined pulse sequence in EasySpin, and you just specify it with two pulse ECEM in the exp.sequence field. Now, um, this, in this experiment, the tau value is incremented in small time steps, and then the echo uh, keeps decaying. Um, so we have to specify the time increment. DT is used for that. And uh, we'll take a value of 10 nanoseconds, but the, the units that are required for easy spin are microseconds. So it will be 0 0.01 microseconds for the increment. And all we need to do now is just call Saffron with the information about the spin system and the spin center and uh, the experiment. Now we're running this section with control enter as usual, will give us um, a plot. I'm going to dock this plot here. You can see, um, like many functions in EasySpin that do some sort of calculations, if you don't ask for any output, it will generate a plot of the results for that allows you to quickly look at whether it's working. And then once it's working and you know what it does, you can then request the outputs and then uh, further uh, process the uh, simulated spectra further. So on the top, you see the simulated time domain signal for this two-pulse ECM. So the tau value is on the x-axis. On the vertical axis, you have the echo amplitude. Um, I think this, this uh, value is 2.56 is close to four times pi, which is, yeah, it is, which is the current normalization of the echo amplitude. But this might change in the future. Um, you can see that there's a, there's a, a frequency that persists for a long time, a fairly high frequency. And there are some lower frequencies present in the early parts of the, uh, <clears throat> of the echo decay. The bottom line, um, the bottom plot shows a Fourier transform of the top time domain signal. And it shows both the real part of that Fourier transform <clears throat> in red and the magnitude in the absolute value in blue. And you can see here, this is a, a proton with a hyperfine coupling of three and six megahertz. And if you are familiar with this type of hyperfine spectroscopy, um, then you immediately recognize you'll have the two hyperfine peaks here at the center, uh, plus uh, center that the Larmor frequency of uh, the nucleus, uh, 15 megahertz, plus minus half the hyperfine coupling. And you can also, uh, a special feature of two pulse ECM is that you get the sum combination peak of those two frequencies, which gives this peak here at 30 megahertz. And you have the difference combination peak, which is down at five megahertz. And you can see in the, in the real part of the Fourier transform, these combination peaks are negative in intensity. So they have a different phase uh, than the, uh, the base uh, single quantum uh, peaks. So this is how you simulate a very basic two pulse ECM uh, with easy spin. Now we can add uh, a relaxation time, and to do that, just say sys.t2 equals, and let's say add maybe 10 microseconds, if that is the t2 value. Again, microseconds is the canonical unit in EasySpin for uh, pulse uh, delays. And 
we can run this section again and now we will see something that looks apparently very different but still gives the same spectrum. Um, the echo amplitude starts out at 12.56 at as before but then decays as tau goes on and if you zoom in to the very beginning part you can see that the modulation of the echo amplitude is still present although it's very weak. Um, so in a practical situation this of course would create some 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 signal to noise challenges to acquire properly um, but uh, you can simulate this uh, even these these very um, small modulations very easily uh, with uh, with easy spins saffron okay now let's increase the the hyperfine coupling to say 10 and 40 and let's see what happens that looks crazy right so now we've got um, We've got a time domain signal with some frequencies at the beginning, other frequencies in the middle, and yet other frequencies at the end. And the spectrum shows a lot of structure. This is an artifact. This is due to simulation noise as a result of not using enough orientations. But we can fix that in the same way as we can fix that for Pepper and uh, using opt.n knots. And we can maybe start out with 40 knots and see how, how that uh, works. Again, make sure to add, if you define options, make sure to add the options as a third input to the uh, easy spin simulation functions. Control enter. Yeah, gives something that looks essentially the same as before. So we probably have to go up to 80 uh, knots. Oh, and it starts, in, uh, starts looking better. You can see that the time domain signal is that's much more converged all the way out to about two and a half microseconds. It's still garbled or unconverged later. And that's a typical um, uh, phenomenon that you see. If you don't have enough points, you will see that the later part of your time domain uh, is, is, is not converged, but the early part might already be. And the reason for this is that, you know, you've, you've sampled uh, different orientations which give different resonance frequencies. These resonance frequencies are close to each other, right? They all belong to this uh, in this spectrum. They, and they start all out with the same phase at the beginning of tau. So they just stay really nice together. But as time goes on, they just run out of um, run out of phase and, 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 and start generating these, these artifacts if you don't have enough resolution of your resonance frequency. Okay, I think we need to increase this, increase this further. Let's try 200. Well, and as you can see with 200, we're now nicely or fairly nicely converged. We see no artifacts. We see some initial high frequencies that decay away and then some persistence lower frequency. The persistent lower frequency is due to this peak, which is intense and not very wide. And the higher frequency that decay away quickly are due to this broad peak, which is from the single quantum, um, uh, single quantum uh, transitions. Okay, now it's, let's cut this hyperfine coupling in half and see what happens. Right now I cut the hyperfine coupling in half, so it's only 0.5 and 20 megahertz. You can see the modulation depth is a little smaller and uh, we have a persistent high frequency oscillation, which corresponds to the double quantum transition here, which is at 30 megahertz plus a little bit. And the two, um, single uh, uh, quantum transitions uh, both are very broad and the difference peak is kind of here very very close to zero you almost can't see it so this is um this is how saffron works saffron has a series of predefined pulse sequences um, let's just switch over to the documentation um, there is a pulse epr there's a whole a separate section on simulating pulse epr and what we're looking at right now is pulse EPR and ender with ideal pulses. So what Saffron assumes in this very, very simple interface is that the pulses are very, very short and powerful, and um, there is no uh, limits to excitation bandwidth, and there's nothing evolves during, the, during those pulses. And these are called, these infinitely short pulses are called uh, ideal pulses. And the reference for Saffron is here. There's also more to it. Um, there is uh, there are shape pulses, and we'll have a session on shape pulses tomorrow. You can also do um, pulse EPR simulation with real pulses, and, and, and Saffron can take care of that. And then there is much more advanced capabilities in a separate function called SPIDIAN, 
that um, actually Stefan Pribitzer, who is running um, who is running the tech for this workshop, uh, did in his PhD in the Yashka lab at ETH Zurich. So this is now incorporated into EasySpin. That's here. We won't have time to cover much of this, unfortunately, but um, I might show a little bit tomorrow in one of the uh, free topic sessions. Anyway, so the simple Saffron interface assumes ideal pulses and um, it's just, it's, it has a very, very brief, um, compact input syntax. So the next thing, uh, let's see, let's try another experiment here. We could, for example, to uh, a high score, which is a two dimensional uh, pulse CPR experiment. Again, we clear, uh, we clear everything up. And then I'm just going to use, uh, again, just a single proton with a strongly inosotropic hyperfine coupling, minus 5 and 20, and a static, uh, external static field of 350 millitesla. And next, we're going to simulate so x dot sequence equals high score. It's a two dimensional pulse CPR spectrum. We'll have to specify a tau value for that, which is the delay between the first two pulses, 0 0.010. Again, always microseconds for pulse CPR and easy spin. And the time increment, dt, which could be, you know, typically a 60 nanoseconds or so that, you know, could be useful. Uh, to make sure we get a smooth spectrum, again, let's use a lot of knots because we have a large anisotropy. And actually, that's, um, that's a very general principle. The larger the anisotropy of your spin system, the more orientations you need to include to get good uh, averaging. And this applies not to, not to pulse CPR only, but also to pepper and also to chili. Right? So anisotropy, large anisotropy, more knots. So very anisotropic spectra just take more time to simulate because you need more orientations. Okay, so now we set the knots. Let's call saffron with the system, the experiment, and the options. Okay, this is ready, I think. Control Enter will run this section. And voila, we've got, we've got a plot that shows, shows two things. On the left, it shows the time domain signal, the real part of it. And you can see there's two axes to it. It's a two-dimensional experiment. We can actually zoom in. Um, to the very initial part, and we'll see that there's actually oscillations going on. If you are not familiar with high score, but you have some um, NMR background, high score is essentially a, a, a um, like an NMR experiment with two indirect dimensions. And uh, usually the direct dimension in EPR is, a, is the echo intensity, but it's, that's usually integrated out instead of an FID. <clears throat> okay, and then the second plot here on the right shows you the analyzed um, high score data in terms of its um, frequency spectrum, which is two dimensional. There's the frequency nu1 along the x-axis, which is the Fourier transform along t1. And the vertical axis is nu2, which is the frequency resulting from the Fourier transform uh, of t2. Okay, And you can see there's two quadrants. Um, the other two are not shown because they're, they're, they repeat themselves. In this first quadrant here in the plus plus side, we see two ridges that are like that are curved, and the second quadrant is empty. This is exactly what you expect for these strong hyperfine a fairly strong hyperfine coupling, but it's not too large. As you can see, it's very smooth. Um, if we hadn't had enough time points, uh, orientations, let's go down to 10 and let's see what happens. If you only have 10 time points, then uh, 10 orientations, you see we'll get individual peaks that clearly show you that the resonance frequency of, these, uh, these nuclei, of this proton is strongly orientation dependent. And in a time domain, you get some sort of checkered pattern um, that's completely artifactual. So let's increase the number of knots again, 20. It gets a little smoother. You can start to see the outlines of these smooth ridges. And I think with 100, we're essentially converged, yes. With 100, you see no, no, no more checkered patterns on the time domain, and you see smooth ridges here. Well, these ridges are curved because of second order effects. Um, and, and actually, this is very useful for analyzing these type of spectra. So this is how high score spectra work. Um, now, as I said, all these 
simulations assume infinite excitation bandwidth. So you're making an infinitely short pulse. It excites every single spin in the uh, in your sample tube, no matter what its resonance frequency is. Um, that's of course completely unrealistic, right? Because if you choose a microwave frequency of 9.5 gigahertz and you make a pulse at that frequency, it will only excite spins that resonate at 9.5 gigahertz plus minus a little bit. Um, so, so these limited excitation bandwidth is usually determined by the pulse length and also potentially by your resonator uh, dip, uh, how, how wide the resonator dip is. And both things can be approximately represented in these simple pulse EPR simulations with a parameter called um, excitation width. So let's take an, let's make an example. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take um, a simple system, just gonna copy paste it. Um, you're gonna and clear everything up. G value of two, a proton with a strongly isotropic hyperfine coupling. Um, a field value that corresponds to X band. And now let's uh, define some, uh, let's define a two pulse experiment a two pulse ECM sequence with a tau value of 120 uh, nanoseconds. And then we increment these tau values with 12 nanoseconds for each time point, And we'll take about 300 points total. Um, again, this is a anisotropic system. So in that case, we always have to increase the number of knots because the default number is insufficient. And let's see how it looks like. Okay, so here's just again our simple uh, a simple simulation. You see, we don't start at zero now. We start at 120 nanoseconds. Um, this is something that is called the dead time, and it's unfortunate, but um, it will actually. You know, it's the only thing that we can't measure all the way down to zero. It has some some bad consequences for the Fourier transform. It generates these kind of phase uh, phase drifts in the real part of the Fourier transform, and you can see that here. In the red curve as well, it has kind of this notch down here, and that's why typically we have to take the magnitude to get m to get reasonable reasonable um, spectral line shapes out. Okay, so now this still assumes that we excite the entire spectrum. <clears throat> okay, next uh, let's actually look how the spectrum looks like. Right, we are at this field of 350 millitesla. and uh, we haven't looked at the EPR spectrum yet. This here is the Fourier transform of an echo decay. So let's do that. And for this, I'm going to just define now a new experiment structure. I'm going to call it CW exp at this field. And we're going to just look at the frequencies from 9.7 to 9.9 .9 gigahertz. OK, so I'm making a subplot again, a two by one layout of, uh, of plots. I'm going to plot into the first figure here and calling pepper with that spin system we have and the CW EPR parameters. Control enter will give us a spectrum. As you can see, it is a very narrow spectrum. After all, we have an isotropic G and we have a uh, fairly small hyperfine coupling of five and 10 megahertz, which is you know, less than a millitesla. Right? So if you zoom in, you can see as expected uh, two peaks. It's a proton, you see two peaks. And you can see here outside, you can see two very, very small peaks as well. Let me zoom in a little more here and here. These are forbidden transitions, which are uh, not entirely forbidden for this particular uh, combination of parameters. OK, now let's limit the excitation uh, window. Let's uh, what are we going to do here. Let's say we're going to set the microwave frequency to 9.797 which is kind of a centered, centered right here where the spectrum is in the, uh, in the EPR spectrum at 350 millitesla. And we're going to restrict the bandwidth. I'm going to say ex excite width equals 100. And this is in megahertz. So I'm telling, um, I'm telling EasySpin to put the pulse at this position here and then go plus minus 100 megahertz, which is a lot. It goes kind of from here all the way to here. This should still excite the entire spectrum and give us um, and, and give us the actual uh, nice uh, result. So now uh, let's ask Saffron to give us back the results. So I'm, so I'm going to Saffron again with the system, the experiment, the options. 
but I'm requesting the time axis, the signal, and some more um, all the details results from Saffron. Uh, okay, we can run this. It runs the simulation, but of course it doesn't plot anything. So we need to make another subplot here. Uh, mm, two, one. Let's see how we're going to do this here. Two, one, two. And we're going to plot um, the result has a frequency axis in it and the magnitude from the result of the frequency domain signal. So results here <clears throat> this here, if, if you look at the workspace browser, result is a structure, right? And if you click on it, it actually opens up. It shows you that there's a frequency axis in there, F, the frequency domain signal, which is the spectrum, and the time domain signal, TD, which is the echo amplitude as a function of time. Okay, so we're going to just plot the frequency domain signal against the frequency axis in the second subplot. Let's go over to the figure and see where we're at. And here you can see the, the spectrum. Again, we have the two base hyperfine peaks, then the sum combination frequency and the difference combination frequency. In this raw plot, I've also plotted and in, included the negative part, but that's kind of repetitive and you could just drop it. Um, let's, let's put for um, reference, let's put a line at the microwave frequency we're using in. In order to do that, we just have to say, before we do the simulation, we just say x line, which draws a line at the specific x value of x dot microwave frequency. And let's say its color should be red. X line is, this is a very, very convenient MATLAB function that allows you to draw horizontal and vertical lines. And well, the other one is Y line, of course, for, for the horizontal lines. Uh, across across your plot, so you can make some alignments or reference uh, reference lines. Okay, and here you see it. We have a hundred megahertz excitation around this red line. Now we can reduce the excitation width to let's say ten megahertz or let's say mid twenty, and we, we see no change. But now let's say we move the resonance frequency out to like nine point seven two. And we get no spectrum, right? Because the pulse is now working at 9.72 and only exciting 20 megahertz. So this is the way how uh, Saffron incorporates uh, kind of a basic way um, of, of dealing with limited excit excitation band. So um, the last thing I'd like to show you in this kind of really quick overview of pulse EPR simulations is how to define a custom pulse sequence. So Saffron has a, a bunch of predefined pulse sequences. You can find them over in the documentation in the Saffron reference page. If you click there, it will take you to um, this page here and, and under sequence, predefined experiments, you can see there's a separate page that tells spells out. We have a two pulse ECM, three pulse ECM, four pulse ECM, where we still have to write the documentation for that, high score, and also MIMS endor. So these are the predefined sequences, but beyond that, you have to write your own function, um, your own pulse sequence. And it's actually fairly straightforward. So let's clear uh, everything up. Let's start with a spin system of one half and the nucleus of uh, and, and the proton. Um, now let's introduce um, another way of specifying a hyperfine tensor. There is this other possibility called a underscore that allows you to specify a uh, the hyperfine tensor not just with the x and the y and the z value, but in terms of the isotropic, the axial, and the rhombic part. So that's 5 and 2 and 0. So this means isotropic first. So it's 5 megahertz isotropic plus the axial part, which is 2 megahertz, and the rhombic part is 0. So this is quite useful if you, um, for example, like to fit just the isotropic hyperfine coupling because you already know the dipolar uh, axial and rhombic parts, then use a underscore instead of the A, which takes the AX, AY, and AZ. So we're gonna use this here. Um, and then we, again, let's do experiment with 350 millitesla uh, X-band. 
Now, in order to define the pulse sequence, uh, we need again to use exp.sequence. And what, what we're going to now specify is going to be a series of pulses and delays. And later we're going to instruct Saffron which, how to increment uh, these delays. So we have to put this in a cell array, so curly braces. And um, <clears throat> if you recall, a cell array is a way to collect different types of objects together in an array. So they don't all have to be of the same type, unlike a numeric array, which every entry must be a number. right? So and this makes sense here because we're going to combine pulses and delays. So first, we need to define a pulse. And a pulse is defined just by a structure. And you can call it whatever you want. And um, the minimum you want to specify is the flip angle of the pulse. Uh, a 90 degree pulse, the flip angle is pi over 2. And remember, it's in radians, the, canon, the conventional angle unit in easy spin. So we got a pulse, a basic pulse defined. Um, let's define a tau delay. Let's say make it 10 nanoseconds, so uh, 0.01 microseconds. And we'll probably also need a, if you do a, let's do a three pulse experiment, three pulse ECM. We need a T0, um, that's, let's say, 0.06, again, in microseconds. So these are the ingredients, and now we're going to put them together in a pulse sequence. We're starting out with a pulse first, then we have a tau delay. At the moment, it's just 10 nanoseconds. Then we add the second 90 degree pulse, followed by the T0 delay. Oh. Followed by the third 90 degree pulse, and then a delay of tau. And at that point, we'll get the echo. Now, how um, in order to actually get the uh, three pulse uh, echo decay, what we're doing, we're incrementing D0, uh, T2. No, sorry, no. T0, right? This is being incremented. This is the second delay. The first delay is tau, the second delay is T0. And we want to increment this along the first dimension of our uh, final data. In order to do that, we say exp.dim1, indicating this is for the dimension 1. Again, a cell array. And then we'll tell, we tell it D2, which means the second delay. and increment that by 0 0.005. And this is, of course, again, in uh, microseconds. So this instructs Saffron to increment the second delay five nanoseconds every time. And we also just have to give a, a few number of points here, let's say 512 points. Again, uh, it's anisotropic, so let's add enough knots to get a smooth simulation. And then Saffron, sys, comma, exp, comma, opt. All right. So now if you run this, you indeed do get, uh, now you see if you don't ask Saffron for anything back, it will plot the time domain on top and the spectrum at the bottom. The time domain, it shows both the, the in-phase and out-of-phase part, and you can see that there is a modulation, right? The modulation is there. And the Fourier transform of that modulation is shown here at the bottom with the magnitude, um, again, in, in, in uh, in blue. So this is now a three pulse ECMS spectrum simulated by manually specifying the pulse sequence. Now this is one of the predefined experiments. You don't have to do that, but um, it just shows you in principle how these custom pulse sequence with sequences work. And um, beyond the flip angle, you can also specify many other things about pulses like finite length, uh, or if you want to chirp the frequency during the pulse, and it all uses the same type of interface. So this is just a great starting point to explore this part of easy spin. Uh, we'll talk more about pulse shaping tomorrow, but won't have too much time to, to go into advanced pulse EPR simulations at this point. Okay, I think this is all I wanted to show for, um, for this particular uh, pulse EPR session. We've got um, as next coming up the question and answers. And before we start that, let me, uh, remind you guys to go to the Slido poll and enter your favorite topic that you would like us to cover tomorrow during the free um, the free topic sessions that we haven't planned out yet. So go over to Slido and fill out the poll. From my side, I can see that uh, some 90 people already have filled uh, things in, but 
And the others who haven't yet, please do, so we can get a good overview of uh, what you what everybody is interested in. Okay, uh, we are at 10, uh, 11, 20. So this is the end of the Pulse CPR session. Uh, we have a 10 minute break and then uh, in 10 minutes at 11.30, we'll start the Q&A session and see you there.